um, I think the title of my talk is a bit self-explanatory. However, its connection to security may be less so. And I will admit that it's not like there's a million connections to security, but at one point there will be a very explicit one. So bear with me as I get there. But first, I'd like to ask who here knows any, who, or have, do you know any anthropologists personally? Okay, so very few people. So one of the fun things as an anthropologist is when, let's just say I'm meeting um, my accountant or a doctor for the first time, they usually ask you like, what do you do? And I say, oh, I'm an anthropologist. And, and they kind of um, look very surprised and excited. And usually they think one of two things, Indiana Jones <laughs> or dinosaurs. So digging bones or digging for old temples. And actually, Indiana Jones is anthropology to archeology. span uh, But the type of digging that I do is people. I dig people. And people who tend to be alive, not dead. Um, and then it's also interesting, this accountant then will ask me, after I explain that I'm a cultural anthropologist, um, they, they, they then think, oh, you must work in the jungles of Brazil, right? And I go, no, I work on computer hackers. And so when I say that, they of course think, oh, people who steal you know, my credit cards, which you know, is one legitimate kind of uh, definition. But then I kind of have to explain, no, that's not quite uh, the hackers that I study. Um, so as you can imagine, what is normally supposed to be about like 30 seconds turns into this like five to 10 minute conversation. So I'm an anthropologist, I study hackers. My first project was on free and open source software. Um, and my second project has been on anonymous. Yeah, the, the one drug that actually improves your life, Linux. Um, and so the second project has been on anonymous. I've written two books. Uh, they're very, very different books, actually. The one that's blue, Coding Freedom, is a very academic book. The second one is far more of a popular book. I'll actually be um, asking at least one trivia question, maybe two, as giveaways. And we're also giving away uh, more books. And both books are available as PDFs under Creative Commons license, so you can just Google for them. So yeah, and thanks to my publishers as well. Uh, took them some convincing, especially for the first one. So let me now just get to the talk, um, which is based on anonymous. You know, there's many words I've used over the years to describe anonymous, and these are a couple of them. Hydra, trickster, confusing, enchanting, controversial, irreverent, interesting, unpredictable, frustrating, stupid, really stupid. <laughs> so these are all the different kind of words I use. But one of the words I rarely or it's not words, but I've rarely had to argue against a certain idea. And I've rarely had to argue against the idea that they're terrorists. Now this is an idea that is out there in the world, but I think it's pretty uncommon. And I'm gonna uh, tell you why I think it's uncommon or why that association, which I think the government uh, tried to make a few times fail. But before I get there, the reason why I'm interested in this is because I actually did think that Anonymous was the perfect kind of candidate to be tagged cyber terrorists. Not because they are cyber terrorists, I don't think that they are cyber terrorists, but because terrorism today, along with describing, I think, a legitimate phenomenon with ISIS and Al-Qaeda uh, and some other political groups, is also a political tool used to squash dissent. And uh, this has been the case before 9-11, but after 9-11, the use of terrorism to um, tag radical groups as unacceptable has skyrocketed. And the one book that really um, is quite wonderful, if you're interested in this topic, is Green is the New Red by journalist Will, Pot Will Potter. And this is a quote from the book where he says, since September 11th, the word terrorism has been stretched and pulled and hemmed and tucked and torn and mended to fit a growing body of political whims. And it's affected a number of different groups uh, in the technological sector. For example, Keith Alexander, ex-general of NSA, has said, you know, if you use Tor, you can't see this very well, uh, so let me read it you are a suspect. So the exact quote is the former NSA General Keith Alexander stated that all those communicating with encryption will be regarded as terror suspects and will be monitored and stored 
as a method of prevention. Now, of course, like, who here uses Tor? Right? A lot of people. And most of you actually have not been thankfully apprehended by the US government. But there has been one group who has really been the victim of the political use of the terrorism rhetoric, and this is animal rights activists, um, especially groups who are part of Earth Liberation Front and uh, the animal liberation movement. And I'm going to talk a little bit about them because I think it's important to understand why I think Anonymous was such a good candidate. Um, so in 2004, the FBI really made uh, eco-terrorism a priority. So in 2004, John Lewis, Deputy Assistant Director of the FBI, Counterterrorism Division, declared in testimony to the Senate Judiciary Committee the FBI's investigation of animal rights extremists and eco-terrorism matters is our highest domestic terrorism investigative priority. And soon after this, there were some really interesting kind of uh, crackdowns and arrests. And the one that's actually the most disturbing has to do with a group of people who ran a website on behalf of animal rights activists but never engaged in any forms of sabotage or direct action. So it's my first trivia, and the hardest one, because there tends to be not so many animal rights activists among hackers, but what the heck, let me try. Does anyone know the name of the group that faced arrests and jail time for running a website on behalf of the animal rights activists? Okay. Animal Liberation Fund. No, it was... <laughs> All right, that's okay. No one tends to get this. I mean, I have to give this trivia at an animal rights conference or something. So it's the Shack 7. And they only ended up being sexism. Uh, but the Shack 7. <laughs> I don't think they count, like hackers. So they were originally seven. So they were convicted under the Animal Enterprise Act for campaigning to shut down a notorious animal testing lab, Huntington Life Sciences. The Shack 7 campaign didn't involve anthrax, pipe bombs, or plot to hijack an airplane. They ran a website. On that website, they posted news about the campaign, legal actions like protests, and illegal actions like stealing animals from labs, and unabashedly supported all of it. Since the federal government has largely been unable to catch groups like the AOF and Earth Liberation Front prosecutors went after lawful activists in the spotlight. And many of these spent two to three years in jail uh, for running websites. So this is the most kind of disturbing consequence. Now what's interesting was this happened, I believe, in 2004, the trial. They were prosecuted under this law that then became a terrorism law. So the Animal Enterprise Protection Act in 2006 became the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And it applies to anyone who intentionally damages or causes the loss of any real or personal property used by an animal enterprise. <laughs> And actually, when the Shack 7 had to appeal their case, they had to appeal it under a terrorism law. Since that time, um, people who have done things like liberate minks um, have been charged under the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And I'm not here to justify their actions. I mean, some of them are very extreme, arson, liberating animals, harassing people who work for these companies. But what is interesting and has to be noted um, is that there's never any kind of loss of life, right? There's no murders of people, and they're, in fact, very uh, against that. And so I actually do think that the terrorism label doesn't fit. It should be sabotage. Um, there's laws on the book that do work for them. Um, and so I find this very, very troubling. And what's interesting is that the story I'm telling about the use of the terrorism label does not just apply to the United States, although the United States is really the epicenter of this sort of activity. It's occurring in different places. So there's a group in France called the Tarnac Nine, and they actually managed to shut down the train system in France, not all France, in part of France. And again, their aim was not to uh, do, they didn't want to harm property or loss of life, but they were able to kind of shut down the train system for a while. And they were initially charged for conspiracy in the service of terrorism. Those charges were dropped. The prosecution is now looking to reinstate them. And this is a very good moment in France for that, given uh, what happened with terrorism acts. I'm actually going to Spain next week, and 
I'm giving a version of this talk, and the example I'm giving there are two puppeteers who are also being charged with conspiracy to incite terrorism uh, because in their puppet show, um, they are kind of representing Basque independence. And because there's some Basque terrorists, by extension, they're being charged with conspiracy for terrorism. So um, basically, we're in a moment where monkey wrenching sabotage, you know, is being equated with terrorism. And so, you know, as you can see, but I'll get more specific, anonymous in some ways can fit under that rubric if these are the trends that are going on. But before, I, I want to talk a little bit more specifically. In some ways, I just talked about the general reasons why anonymous was in a good position to be slapped with this label. Um, and then I want to talk about the more specific ones related to the cyber uh, world. But before I do, some of you might be thinking, well, you know, I actually think that this label exists and um, it has kind of stuck uh, quite effectively. So now I just want to convince you of why I think um, they're not really associated with terrorism, generally. It might you know, be the case for a few people. Well, one source I have are news articles, journalism articles. Um, many of them are not positive. Um, many of them are quite negative. But nevertheless, most news articles refer to anonymous as activists or hacktivists, with very few referring to them as terrorists or even a dark evil menace. The most negative word that you see are vigilantes, right? Uh, which is not quite the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, that could be a fear of retribution. I mean, interestingly enough, Anonymous does have a couple of rules and norms, one of which is a very strong anti-celebrity ethic. You shouldn't do anything for self-promotion. And the other one is you should never attack the media. And uh, like all good rules and norms, they get broken, but they get broken rarely, right? And so I actually think, I mean, no, they would not like it if they were called terrorists. And indeed, that you know, rule would be broken more in some ways. But they have been called terrorists by news organizations, and they haven't been attacked, right? So I don't know. It's a good question, though, because that is certainly a dynamic. But that's one source. Another um, data point has to do with the fact that about once, twice a month, <coughs> I get emails from students all over the world, sometimes from a cheerleader from Ohio, sometimes it's a middle school student uh, from Peru, who um, are writing a paper in school for their teachers on Anonymous. And they are writing about them in terms of activism and hacktivism, not in terms of terrorism, right? And I would assume that if the student also would write about them as terrorists, they would also contact me. And I do get this quite often. And now I'm going to actually show you a small clip of a video from a middle school student from Peru who created the video for a class. And you know, it's not the most stellar video in the world. It's pretty good. Good introduction to anonymous. But I think this captures how many of these high school students and middle school students tend to see anonymous. All right, I'm actually going to skip the video. Hopefully the next one will work, because the next one's pretty important. I'll kind of have it just flashing in the background. Uh, the kid sort of is explaining what an hacktivism is, uses anonymous as one example of many. And then actually, he um, raises a few hacks in Peru, in specific by anonymous in Peru. Um, and for example, they were doing some protests because um, a cultural center that was painted with a bunch of murals was just repainted yellow, so Anonymous kind of attacked um, the government, and in one instance, they left like a porn video because it was Anonymous, and that's how they uh, protest. So that's another data point. Um, another very interesting one has to do with the total proliferation of TV shows and films um, that represent hackers and Anonymous in specific. And so there's tons of them that actually have all sorts of references. Mr. Robot is obviously not primarily about Anonymous, but there's actually all these references, um, such as the famous uh, Church of Scientology video that Anonymous did, where they declared war against the Church of Scientology. They actually copycat that and modify that in Mr. Robot. Uh, another more very kind of explicit um, 
connection is in the film called Who Am I? Uh, which is actually a really wonderful German film, blockbuster kind of Hollywood style that's not just about hacktivists, it's about hacking as well. There's kind of a couple of storylines and themes, but Clay is trying to outdo Anonymous and WellSec and they're very kind of political and hacktivist oriented. I actually really recommend this movie and if anyone wants it, I have it on the USB key. Uh, so feel free to come to me. It was really hard to initially get um, and I was able to get it, but now I, I hear it on the part site. Um, another, <laughs> film that was quite surprising where Anonymous showed up was a film about a bunch of uh, geek nerd kids in the hood called Dope, uh, which is about drugs, dope. Um, and here they say like low set level shady, there's all these references to Bitcoin and Aaron Schwartz. It's a really good movie. So as my next trivia that I think someone will get, so I've just mentioned a couple of films and TV shows where Anonymous has been in. Any other examples? Uh -huh. The IT crowd? I actually don't know. I haven't seen that one. But they they have come up explicitly? Yes. Okay. I trust you. <laughs> All right, another one. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. Okay. How about uh, one that takes place in our country's capital? Oh, House of Cards. House of Cards, yes, House very cards. much so. And actually, some a member of Anonymous consulted, and there's all these uh, kind of inside jokes. And um, they also appear in The Good Wife and Homeland as well. And I've actually been contacted by like 10 other Hollywood producers who are making uh, other TV shows and films. So they're in the pipeline. So that, again, they're not represented as, as um, terrorists. That's the important thing. Again, sometimes malicious, but not necessarily terrorists. So now I want to kind of return to this question why I think this association was very right for making in a kind of more specific register. So as we know, there's a long-standing cyber warfare and cyber terrorism frame, right? This is a framework that exists. And I actually do think it's possible to have something that is close to cyber terrorism if the right infrastructure is hit, right? But this frame has existed for an extremely long time. It's not going to be a surprise to anyone here. One of the kind of first mentions of cyber terrorism came in 1991 with this report, Computers at Risk, Safe Computing in the Information Age, and it's the last line which matters. Tomorrow's terrorists may be able to do more damage with a keyboard than with a bomb. And of course, this rhetoric only intensified post uh, 9-11. Right? So another reason why I think this association was right for making was because some quarters of Anonymous engaged in high-risk hacking and, in fact, sabotage full on. And I'll describe some in a moment. But here, I'm going to quote Corey Doctorow, a science fiction writer, who wrote a very nice review of my book. And I think he just does a good job of capturing this high-risk hacking. So in the kind of hacking that Anonymous does by means of the fluid, structuralist norms of the group, half macho posturing, half uber savvy media planktorship is doubly exciting, or excited squared. It is filled with drama, betrayal, police informants, intimidation, brinkmanship, insane risk taking, and impassioned speeches from the battlements. Um, and for those that need a slight refresher of Anonymous, just in case, just as a reminder, Anonymous was initially a name used for internet trolling. There were designated the internet hate machine by Fox News, which Anonymous kind of embraced the term, because um, they thought it was, yeah, we are the internet hate machine. Uh, eventually, in 2008, there was this series of kind of trolls against the Church of Scientology. They leapfrogged into activism and actually started to engage in all sorts of kind of um, Hacktivist, activist interventions. And in 2011, in specific, there was a shitload of hacking occurring under LulzSec and AntiSec. And this is, in, in some ways, what Corey was referring to. And in specific, I personally, in 2011, in the summer, is when I started to get extremely paranoid myself. And I was just wondering when the FBI would kind of knock on my door and try to get my data 
because they were, you know, engaging in so many shenanigans from hacking into NATO, into security companies and deleting everything. They were telling the FBI to fuck off every single Friday. <laughs> you know, this was pretty heavy shit. And, you know, most famously in this time period, they hacked H.B. Gary, which was a revenge hack because um, Aaron Barr, who worked for H.B. Gary, claimed that he had infiltrated Anonymous, he had found the key operatives, and was going to go to the FBI with the names. The names were wrong, in fact, and they were published in the Financial Times. And then in one evening, Anonymous completely owned H.P. Gary, put all their emails online, deleted everything, um, and boasted about it, and hacked a Twitter account of H.P. Gary. And you had folks like Greg Hoogland here saying, this is not hacktivism. He, um, he's the president of H.P. Gary. This is not hacktivism, it is terrorism. So some people were making this association, right, um, because of this high-risk hacking. Another interesting reason why I think it was right for making was that some of the hacktivists involved in Anonymous were on terrorism watch lists, one of them, and that's uh, Jeremy Hammond. And uh, thanks to some leaked documents, he was, um, it was revealed that he was a possible terrorist organization member. But you know what's interesting about it? He was actually considered a terrorist not because he was a hacker, but because he was an anarchist and environmentalist. It goes back to that green scare, right? But nevertheless, he was known as a kind of hacker and an anarchist, and he was kind of um, under suspicion. Now, another reason why I think the, the association was right for making was, again, the government really, really, as you all know, disliked Anonymous very much, but I like to kind of remind people of it uh, in a more tangible way. This was a slide that was also kind of uh, leaked as part of the Snowden documents. And it is a slide about TOR and what it's used for. And they recognize that there's some good elements to TOR, that people living in oppressive countries circumvent firewalls. And the bad uses are you know, uses by pedophiles. State actors can launch attacks without being attributable and anonymous and well set, right? So they're there with the pedophiles and stuff like that. Now, there was one attempt in specific that I think was a very kind of clear but oblique attempt to associate anonymous with terrorism. And it came in this article uh, in the Wall Street Journal, which was published in February 2012. Does anyone remember this article by any chance or recognize it? So it was an interesting article. Um, it was published exactly on February 21st, 2012. And basically, it quoted or it really reported that Keith General Alexander, who at the time was the director of the NSA, that he had briefed officials in the White House in a secret meeting. Alexander claimed that Anonymous could have the ability within the next year or two to bring about a limited power outage through a cyber attack. Now, you know, it's very vague language, could have the capability, it's very different from saying they want to do it, but nevertheless, as a form of kind of rhetoric, it's very clear what is being done here. They're being kind of considered as such an evil menace that they might have the capability and desire to take down critical infrastructure. To me, this was a very strong attempt. And what's interesting was that I actually think it totally failed. And it failed because security experts, like many people in this room, came back and said, and talked to the mainstream media, and said, it's extremely unlikely. Um, experts consider such a scenario to be extremely unlikely, and then anonymous spokesperson submits the whole idea as ridiculous. And it never really gained any traction. I'm gonna go back to that story a little bit later. Um, but now I want to transition to why this attempt uh, failed, why the you know, associations that were tossed out there uh, failed. So that's what I'm gonna do for the rest of the talk. All right, there's a, you know, like most things, there's never one or two reasons, there's a handful of reasons. The first um, reason has to do with timing and who Anonymous supported in its early activist history. Although Anonymous is well known for its um, high-risk hacking. It's not the only thing that it has done, right? 
Uh, it's engaged in many, many different kinds of activities. And in 2010, late 2010, it intervened um, when WikiLeaks was censored by PayPal, MasterCard, and Visa. And some people may remember this because this occurred after WikiLeaks released all these diplomatic cables. Uh, the US government got incredibly mad and basically asked uh, all sorts of corporations to stop processing services to um, Assange and WikiLeaks. And what was so fascinating about this moment was, you know, Assange and WikiLeaks are very kind of controversial, right? But nevertheless, a lot of people who didn't like WikiLeaks or Assange, nevertheless, were aghast at the fact that there was this kind of preemptive form of censorship, including journalists who really disliked Assange. Um, and this was a moment when the government, again, was incredibly upset as Assange. And in fact, um, I don't think Sarah Palin was actually saying this at this point, but it felt like a good match. Uh, so Assange <laughs> down the same group to pursue al-Qaeda and Taliban leaders. Here's an attempt to associate Assange with um, terrorism. And Anonymous rose up at this point with a very, very large DDoS attack. There was over 7,000 people that showed up on one of their chat channels. Um, over 30,000 downloads of low urban uh, pen and happened. And again, a lot of um, First Amendment loyalists don't like DDoS attacks for obvious reasons, right? But nevertheless, I think a lot of people supported this um, action just because people were so upset that WikiLeaks was censored. So also what occurred was that there was an unbelievable amount of media articles about this event, right? And so the framing that occurred at that moment was going to matter greatly. So actually, I went back and, and looked through many of these uh, articles and newscasts, and again, all over the place. It's not always positive. It's often very negative. But very rarely is it about cyber war um, or terrorism. And now I'm going to actually sh show you a clip that I hope works because it's such a good video of CNN. Um, and they are reporting on the attack. Here's the real meaning of WikiLeaks' story. The powerlessness of world government and institutions in the Internet era. In the last few days, supporters of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange have launched Operation Payback, shutting down major websites like Visa, MasterCard, and PayPal. One of the alleged perpetrators is all of 16 years old. Nick O'Mealy is the perfect person to speak to this new wild, wild net. He's been on the cutting edge of social media and politics. He ran Howard Dean's 2004 presidential internet campaign and teaches about technology and government at Harvard's Kennedy School. It seems a little bit scary to me that you, anybody can organize an attack on an institution and shut them down. What does that mean? It's almost like a sit-in, right? I mean, anybody could go sit in the lobby of a bank and shut the bank down for an hour. That's a fascinating metaphor. I've never even thought about it this way, but, but it really isn't. I mean... I, this is a few people. First of all, sit-in requires many people. Second of all, it only shuts down that one little branch. This was right at the heart of, of the Internet's infrastructure for major global institutions, and they went kaput. And how many people did it take to organize this? Just well, it a took a few people to organize it, but, but hundreds of thousands to participate. It's a denial-of-service right. attack. What they do is they get lots of people to all request the website at the same time, and they figure out ways of automating it, but it's still a broad, coordinated activity. PayPal shuts down WikiLeaks' account, but you can still give money through PayPal to the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, this was a political action these hackers took, a, a, an, an act of civil disobedience. So is this something we should admire? I, I absolutely think it's something we should admire. You know, they're standing up for a political, for a political value they believe in which is a radical free speech on the Internet. I'd argue maybe it's the only value the Internet actually has. You say you admire them. How far does that go? I mean, cyber war is the new frontier. China is well, hacking in. China could shut down our grid. Where, where do you draw the line of what's permissible? I mean, I wouldn't equate this with cyber war. I don't want, uh, you know... I, I, Why not? I, well, because I, they didn't, I don't know that they broke any laws, right? Well, uh, the, all they did was show up. All they did was show up. All they did was request the website. A lot of people requested the website at once. If China were to do that and were to try to overwhelm our <laughs> internet structure, <laughs> would down. that be cyber war? Well, I, th th you're talking about a sovereign state going after another sovereign state critical infrastructure. Well, I what mean, was a non-sovereign 10,000 people who were anarchists? Well, let's get real. This was a brief attack that actually d d sl uh, disabled a few systems for a very short period of time. It's very analogous to a sit-in. 
I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, but there you see how um, one host was really trying to kind of get him to sort of admit that this was a major act of cyber war and was saying it was hitting at the heart of critical infrastructure. It was the PayPal blog, for Christ's sakes. That's like the <laughs> furthest thing from critical infrastructure. And um, PayPal has a blog? Yeah, yeah. Like it was the pay I know. PayPal has a blog. What do they put on that blog? Um, and it's true, it was actually, the websites were down for very short periods of time, right? Um, it was spectacular because so many people contributed and they were hitting a lot of different sites, but nevertheless, it was very helpful to have this person kind of rein in the problematic rhetoric. But you can imagine if they had brought in an expert who in fact said, yes, this is cyber war, right? CNN still commands a lot of power to set the standards and the frames, and that didn't happen in this case. Now what's interesting with this question of timing is that soon after these DDoS attacks, which happened in December 2010, in January 2011, Anonymous got involved in the Arab Spring, and quite dramatically. Uh, this was Tunisia, these are Tunisian uh, school children who are thanking Anonymous, because Anonymous were uh, was one of the first groups to get videos out of the country that then was reported in Al Jazeera and these sorts of places. And this was interesting because I think the social revolutions of 2011 were particularly important to prevent that association because Anonymous was so present in these social revolutions which had a lot of support um, in large sectors of the society, it became a little bit harder to take the acts of, let's just say, hacking and sabotage and simply frame them as terrorism. Okay, the next example is probably one of my favorite ones, the adoption of the Guy Fox icon. And it's um, today an, an icon that is often associated with protest, dissent, uh, revolution, but for most of British history in specific, Guy Fox, given the fact that he tried to blow up the British Parliament that was um, headed by a Protestant and he was a Catholic, for most of British history, he was like Britain's Osama bin Laden. He was really a negative figure. Remember, remember, the 5th of November was not to celebrate Guy Fox but to celebrate the fact that he did not succeed and he was executed, right? This was a celebration um, of killing the terrorists. And so what's fascinating is Guy Fox today, you know, is controversial, right? He doesn't have a squeaky clean uh, image because in fact he tried to blow up the parliament, we all know this, but nevertheless the association is quite positive. And it's quite positive uh, because of popular culture and in specific, V for Vendetta, the graphic novel, and then the film really sealed the deal in terms of that transformation. But what you may not know is that the association um, between Guy Fox and kind of more positive revolutionary action came earlier than these two pieces of media. And it came, um, the first book that kind of represented Guy Fox in a positive way was a historical romance. It's called Guy Fox or the Gunpowder Treason, and it's also called A Historical Romance. And it was published in 1850. Um, I'm actually reading the book right now. And, uh, and this was the first book that kind of disassociated him with terrorism. And the, what happened next was especially important, was that people started to write children's books um, where they represented Guy Fox in more of a positive way. So this icon, I think, because it has positive associations, is kind of rubbed off on Anonymous. But I think the story is even a little bit more complicated than that. So who here has seen or read V for Vendetta? OK, a lot of people. Um, it's very, very popular for good reason, really kind of good material. And I think for some people, not all, but for some people, the film today strikes a little bit more like reality than fiction just because uh, a kind of fascist surveillance state is something that um, has been somewhat confirmed by Edward Snowden, and we also know that government officials have kind of lied to the American public. And so there's a way in which fiction seems a little bit closer to reality, and Anonymous, who kind of takes 
again, on some of the quotes from the film, people should not be afraid of their governments, governments should be afraid of their people, ring true to some people today. And I do think that there's this really fascinating loop where you have you know, historical reality with Guy Fawkes that then gets represented in literature, um, that then takes on a new kind of uh, historical reality with Guy Fawkes actually appearing on the streets like in the movie. Fascinating. But this is another really important reason. Okay, so moving right along. Another reason has to do with Anonymous's flexibility slash incoherence. One of the things that Anonymous is famous for is that they stand for uh, nothing and everything, right? They kind of can appear to fight um, rape culture in the United States as they famously did with Op Steubenville, to fight police brutality as they did in Ferguson, um, you know, to hack one of the kind of most prolific groups in Latin America as well as Sec Peru, <coughs> who almost brought down the Peruvian government when they hacked into um, government servers, stole email that showed you know, massive government corruption and the government almost voted to dissolve uh, because of this hack. So they're a little bit everywhere. And some people might think that this is totally unique to Anonymous, but in fact it's not. There's a political phenomena called multiple use names and this uh, professor, Marco Desireev, has written a book which looks at various examples from Captain Swing to Anonymous to Luther Blissett. And basically, um, this multiple use name is usually an alias or a character that is owned by no one, and that different groups claim to, um, to attribute action. So Captain Swing was the name of a character that different farmers in Britain would use um, to lay claim to actions where they destroyed machinery that they thought was threatening their livelihood. Uh, Luther Blissett was created by a bunch of Italian pranksters in the 1990s, and then it spread all over Europe to coordinate pranks. So Anonymous is a multiple use name, and I think unlike ALF or ELF, these animal rights campaigns, which are only about animal rights, so they're a little bit more contained, so it's a little bit easier to tag their one action with terrorism. With Anonymous, since there's so many different things going on, it becomes a little bit harder to say, well, you're terrorism, because those acts which might perhaps be identified with terrorism, like sabotage, um, might be candidates, but is protesting police brutality on the streets an example of that? So I think that's another reason. Another one has to do with their symbolism. Again, Anonymous is extremely controversial, especially in the tech community. I've met people who love them, hate them, don't know what to think about them, right? All over the place. But one thing is clear. They do symbolize anonymity. So while they are involved in many different operations, um, their symbolism, their name, symbolizes that which is under threat today, right? It's a real open question whether we will have anonymity in the future. Um, and I think some people who don't necessarily like their actions or their style of activism nevertheless respect the fact that there's a kind of group that is championing anonymity. And so it receives some measure of support from a community that otherwise may actually not like their actions. Now the next example is an interesting one. And it has to do with ISIS. So ISIS is a very interesting group because unlike Al-Qaeda, they actually really turn to social media to recruit and spread propaganda. And one of the interesting things is that ISIS was quite popular online in 2012, also a year where Anonymous was quite popular and quite visible. And I actually think that the circulation of Anonymous propaganda, which usually entailed some guy sitting behind a desk with a guy fox mask, um, telling people to rise up versus a video of a beheading, which I won't show you, uh, is quite different, right? And a lot of people could differentiate between the kind of gruesome uh, videos produced by terrorists and those anonymous ones. And so while in some ways, sometimes journalists would say, isn't anonymous like ISIS in terms of how they're socially organized, um, and I think connections can be made there, 
nevertheless, the type of material being thrown out by these two different groups made it such that I think it made it just a little bit harder to tag Anonymous as terrorists. And then lo and behold, then Anonymous started to fight the terrorists. Um, and this happened after Charlie Hebdo attacks and after the more recent ones as well. And there's a lot of things I can say about this that I won't, but this was a very interesting moment, especially because the main mainstream press, CNN, CBS, oh my God, they loved Operation ISIS. Even when just the videos were announced and nothing had been done, they were reporting on this. Um, and this is an example from CBS where they did, you know, I don't think 2015 was a huge year for at least English speaking anonymous hackers, but just because they fought ISIS, it was for CBS. Well, all of a sudden, if you have anonymous fighting the terrorists, then they're not the terrorists, right? So this is another kind of layer. Although I want to say that my little arguments were in existence before off ISIS as well. But this, in some ways, kind of sealed the deal. But now I want to finish with my last example. And it has to do with a single kind of event that occurred in January 2012. And I want to just make sure that I have all the details right, so I have a couple notes here. Um, so in uh, 2012, a bunch of European countries and other countries around the world were looking to ratify ACTA, the Anti-Trade Counterfeiting Act. And it was, you know, on the one hand, very popular with governments, and on the other hand, it was very unpopular with citizens, and especially geeks, um, and so on and so forth. And in Poland, in specific, ACTA was being um, considered, and Polish people were so, or some Polish people were so against ACTA that there was protests on the streets. And one day there was 10,000 protesters against ACTA in Poland. So in the midst of kind of popular revolt against ACTA, Anonymous launches Operation Anti-ACTA. And it says, welcome to Operation Anti-ACTA. We encourage you to spread the word of Anti-ACTA far and wide. The top priority is to steal and leak classified government information, including emails and documentation. Prime targets are the Polish government websites and other high-ranking establishment figures. Now, what happened next? So this uh, was announced. I think January 12th or so, and indeed Anonymous engaged in a lot of DDoS attacks and they were took down the Polish government websites, all this stuff. So citizens are hitting the streets and something very unexpected happened on January 26, 2012. So while casting their votes in Parliament, some members of the Polish government concealed their faces with paper Guy Fox masks. So at the height of an anonymous campaign, government officials, parliamentarians had adopted their symbol. One anonymous activist blogged about the importance of this act and wrote, anonymous is not unanimous and opinion on DDoS is perhaps more divided than any other tactic. Indeed, this very faction in consultation with anti-ACTA ACTA NGOs has been calling for help DDoS for the last several days. But after this photo of Polish politicians protesting ACTA went viral yesterday, it's time we all reevaluate the role and legitimacy of DDoS. These parliamentarians were wearing anonymous Guy Fox masks while the parliament's website was down due to a DDoS by anonymous. We can't emphasize this point enough. This is a game changer. From my perspective, I think this was a game changer for how it legitimated anonymous, not simply their tactics, right? I mean, this was a big deal. For many people, a lot of my students don't know that Guy Fox is about V for Vendetta. They think about it in terms of anonymous, right? And so here was government officials in government chambers taking on the Guy Fox mask. At this point, it also became a bit harder to tag anonymous as terrorists, right? A uh, legitimate government. So perhaps it won't come as a surprise when I tell you that that Wall Street Journal article that I referenced earlier it came out two weeks after this news story came out. So this story came out about a month after, a little less than a month. 
And I actually don't think it's entirely accidental in certain ways. I mean, I can never prove it, but there was really no evidence at the time that Anonymous wanted to engage in a cyber attack, that they had the capability to engage in a cyber attack. It really felt like a form of propaganda to me, you know? And at the moment that it came out, I was incredibly concerned and worried. And I'm, uh, as an anthropologist who's an expert on anonymous, I talk to a lot of kind of media organizations and journalists. But it was really the security experts that mattered at that point. You know, as an anthropologist, um, people are not going to take me as seriously with security concerns as the security experts. So I was incredibly relieved when security experts, many who, again, disliked Anonymous, claimed, you know what, there's no evidence of this. Um, that there's more squirrels currently that take down um, <laughs> critical infrastructure than a group like Anonymous, right? Now, of course, uh, critical infrastructure is vulnerable, right? We know this. I'm not saying that. In fact, that's what frightens me so much about this scenario, is that I think under different conditions, let's just say there is a cyber attack against critical infrastructure. Let's say there is loss of life. Let's say the attribution is amorphous. And let's just say it is tagged towards anonymous. Game over, right? And so I really appreciate uh, when experts are able to kind of um, give their advice and set the record straight in some um, way. So now just I'm going to wrap up with a few very, very final points. First of all, uh, you don't need the cyber terrorism framework to um, squash dissent, right? A lot of people have gone to jail because of their work in Anonymous. In the United States, most people got two to 10 years in jail uh, with often fines that were close to a million dollars. In Europe, people tended to be in jail for zero days, a couple months, three months, and the longest was 15 months. So big kind of disparity. Also, remember how I mentioned the Shack 7? Um, there's kind of like the Shack 1 in Anonymous, and that's Barrett Brown, who was a journalist who contributed to Anonymous as Barrett Brown. And uh, he received five years simply because he was too close to the hackers and was willing to kind of take their information and put it out to the public. It's a bit more of a complicated case, and I can't go into the details, but five years for doing no hacking, no conspiring. It's astounding. So these kind of forms of you know, um, prison sentences can go a far way in squashing dissent, irrespective of the terrorism label. But once again, like I said, I think security experts can really set the record straight as to what's appropriate and inappropriate um, when activists and hacktivists engage in political action. And to finish, you know, we are in an interesting moment. This is a statue in Berlin that's going to travel of uh, Chelsea Manning, Assange, and Snowden. Um, and again, all kind of controversial figures, but the fact that they're out in the public, visible, being memorialized, is very different from something like the animal rights activists, who, again, you may not agree with their tactics, but I think calling them terrorism has gone too far and they're marginalized, ghettoized, not visible. So we're in this really kind of interesting moment where these characters are being memorialized in art and film, um, which will allow them to continue doing their activity. I hope, and this is where I'm really closing, that I'm not gonna be back here in five years giving another talk at B-Sides with the parallel different story that from 2010 to 15, it's a story where they escape the terrorism frame and I might come back um, to tell you the story in 2020 of how they were caught by this rhetorical trap. I certainly hope that won't be the case. Um, and I will leave it at that. So thank you very much. So I think there's a little bit of time for questions. I saw the one there. So you know, you've, you've set the stage by talking about uh, an example where Guy Fawkes, where you had a single instance, a single plot, uh, and then with the animal live guys where uh, this is a continuing threat to terrify people not to even get into the space and, and yes they may be bombed and, and burned and whatever else. When you think back to what you say 
that anonymous and, and, and just in general. We have conspiracy laws that, you know, the, the law is what it is, but, but from a moral standpoint, what's your point of view on to what extent you should be accountable when you contemplate joining an organization, participating alongside an organization, associating yourself with that organization, that you're taking on the, the characteristics of, of what the organization has done before and supporting us? With anonymous? With, with anonymous, and, and you know, you can, you can take the position they're terrorists, they're not terrorists. I mean, equally, you seem to be saying, though, if, if you associate with Stop Huntington or Errol or whatever, that, that you're not necessarily a terrorist, or maybe something less than that. And, and so, you, if your point of view is that anonymous are terrorists, then why associate with them? Why not have a different uh, identity? Well, this is precisely the point. Like, with
And so COINTILPRO was a systemic kind of government program, first to discredit communists, but then a lot of activists from the right to the left, including Martin Luther King. They um, threatened Martin Luther King. Or they asked Martin Luther King to commit suicide, for example, uh, or else that they would tell the world that he was involved in the affair. And so what was very visible occurred very invisibly. So then I'd sometimes wonder, oh, is there a different tactic that's going on that we don't see? I mean, it made him maybe too conspiratorially, you know? Uh, but nevertheless, it was so curious for the reasons you highlighted. So maybe one more question? Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Dr. Coleman, for your talk. I'm a big fan of your work. One of the things that you didn't touch on that I, surprised me a little bit, but I wonder if you might address the that there are there's an abstraction problem with impact in judging anonymous actions that actually equate pretty well with the challenges we have as a security community in getting investment, getting budget, that sort of thing. And so could it simply be that it's that abstraction and not understanding how does that impact me individually, what they're doing, that is, is at the root cause, and should a cyber-physical incident happen that gets attributed to them? Would, we, would that be the point? Right. I think, first of all, it's a great question, and you know, it was really interesting, too, because um, while LulzSec was happening, I was living in New York City, and I hung out with a lot of InfoSec guys there, and was interviewing them, and so many of them like, loved LulzSec because it made their job easier, insofar as they were able to go to um, their managers, who went to the CEO, and they were able to get more money for security, precisely because there was a tangibility. You know, it was like every day Volsec is boasting about this hack, that hack, whereas the Chinese and others are very silent, right? And so that abstraction became a little bit more tangible, and they were able to kind of get more resources. It just reminded me of that. I think that's a good, good point, but just two things to bear in mind. Um, animal rights activists, this is, was fascinating, before the concerted push to make them out to be terrorists, I mean, it really was a concerted push uh, to have that happen. They were reported favorably in the New York Times and other such places. I was kind of shocked, right? I sort of did assume a little bit because it was arson, it was very physical, right? That simply was why it had a negative association. But there had to be some work um, that uh, was put into it, but I think you're absolutely right because of that very material basis and made that work easier. And I, I do say that the second that there is a uh, attack against critical infrastructure that leads to loss of life, the game will change. And I think at that moment, it will be a lot easier to kind of forge that connection. Um, that I think is a little bit harder, especially for people who are not involved in computers. It's still hard for them to totally understand what the heck is going on. And that could be manipulated in positive and negative ways, right? Which is why that CNN report mattered so much. If the commentator had actually said that was critical infrastructure and we were, you know, two inches away from loss of life, like a lot of the American public would have been like, ooh, that was scary. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that didn't happen in that case. But yeah, once critical infrastructure is hit, uh, loss of life, and then if that's associated with activism, I think it's kind of going to be game over. Well, I think uh, time is up. Someone wanted a book there, and I'll be around for the next couple.